Hello, welcome to the Michael Corrin Show, and it's, uh, it's a Thursday, and um, Tuesdays and Thursdays we do whatever we want to do. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we have these set panels, and, 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 and we debate all the major issues. Tuesday and Thursday, a selection, federal politics, uh, foreign affairs, faith matters, culture, oh, loads of stuff, really, one-on-one -on -one interviews. We thought we'd tackle the issue, mm, fairly important, I suppose. Does God exist? Yeah, apparently he does. Uh, does God exist? Uh, debate the issue. Um, there's a whole series of these debates going around uh, North America. I, I moderated one in Oshawa, Ontario, just last week. Almost 4,000 people were there, uh, most of them students, almost 4,000. Uh, that's a lot of people, and, and there is huge interest in this subject. Personally, I welcome uh, the, these uh, signs on buses. Uh, God probably doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, let's bring the debate on. Let's have everyone have, have, have their... Their freedom of expression here. Does God exist? We'll debate this issue at the end of it. Um, one person will win, the other one will probably be burning in hell. Let's introduce them. Uh, Dr. William Lane Craig, Research Professor of Philosophy, Talbot School of Theology, La Mirada, California. Hello. Hello. We haven't got any of, any of your books. We should, uh, we could try and sell them for you, but that's okay. Michael Payton, a cognitive scientist at York University. Uh, are you allowed to go to classes these days? Or? No, unfortunately not. It's really a shame what's happening at the university yeah, with this it strike. Is, it is a great shame. I think what we'll do, we, we haven't arranged this before the show, um, we'll go segment by segment, and we won't be too formal about it. Uh, begin with you, sir. The, the proposition, does God exist? If he does, show me how. Show me why. Well, I think there are a number of good reasons to think that God exists. In the debates that I've been having here in Canada, I typically present five reasons and then defend them in greater detail. God is the best explanation for the origin of the universe. God is the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. God is the best explanation for the existence of objective moral values in the world. God is the best explanation for the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And God can be immediately known and experienced. And on that basis, I think it's rational to conclude that God exists. There are no alternative explanations as to uh, why we exist, how we exist, and, and how the, wor the oh, world... Oh, certainly. Began. Certainly there are alternative explanations, and I don't mean to suggest that atheism is irrational or anything of that sort, but I'm suggesting that the best explanation, the more plausible one, is the one that I defend. Where does evolution come into all this? It doesn't come into any of the arguments that I present, because the second argument I give, the design argument, um, doesn't concern the origin of biological complexity. It concerns the remarkable fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the universe given in the Big Bang that scientists have only begun to discover within the last 40 years or so. So that for a biological evolution to take place anywhere in the universe, you have to have this elaborately set table in advance in the initial conditions of the Big Bang that cries out for some sort of explanation. How old is the world? Best estimates today are around 13.7 billion years or so. Now this is good, you see, I, I, this is a position I can embrace because there are people who, who will sit here and say no, it's six and a half thousand years old. Um, you, that, that is not a tenable position? I don't think it's plausible. Uh, mm. the, the arguments that I give are right in line with mainstream science. Uh, I'm not bucking up against mainstream science okay. in presenting these arguments. Rather, I'm going with the flow of what contemporary cosmology and astrophysics uh, support. Is there a contradiction or an inc inconsistency between the biblical account of the age of, of the Earth and, and your statement? Well, that's interesting because there isn't any biblical account of the age of the Earth. There's right. nothing in the Genesis or elsewhere in the Bible that says how old the universe is. So, no, I don't think it is incompatible. Hmm. Uh, we often hear the, the, the rather caricatured argument that uh, Christians believe that man and dinosaur coexisted. There are some creationists, they typically style themselves young earth creationists, mm -hmm. who believe that. I've even seen children's books where Noah takes uh, dinosaur eggs on the ark with him. Well, all of this is reading between the lines. There's nothing like that in the book of Genesis. Mm. Uh, forgive these questions, in a perfect world I wouldn't have to ask them, but um, if God is all good and all powerful and all knowing, why does he allow uh, uh, bad things to happen to good people? This is, I think, the principal argument for the atheistic side that my opponents in the debates will sometimes bring up. And I think that there's a couple of ways to respond to this. First, 
it, it, we need to understand what the atheist is claiming here. Is he arguing that God and suffering are logically incompatible with each other? If he is, then he needs to show that there's some sort of implicit contradiction there because there's no explicit contradiction. And I would say that no atheist has ever been able to sustain that burden of proof to show that there are necessarily true assumptions that would reveal some kind of a contradiction between God and the suffering and evil in the world. In fact, I think we can prove that they are compatible by just adding a third proposition, and that would be that God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil and suffering in the world. As long as that's even possible, it shows that God and evil are logically compatible. So that logical version of the argument doesn't work. Now, very quickly, there's a probabilistic version of the argument which says, all right, God and evil are logically compatible, but nevertheless, it's highly improbable that God exists, given the evil and suffering in the world. And I think there's a number of moves that the theist can make in response to that argument to show that it's, it's not improbable uh, that God exists, given the suffering in the world. I happen to believe, and I'm going to try and be a, a, as objective as I can sure. throughout the debate, um, that the reasons why there is suffering and pain are entirely obvious. And in fact, they're inevitable if there is a loving God. But mm. how would you explain them? Why then does God have to allow discomfort, suffering, pain, sure. terrible pain sometimes to exist? Well, I, I would say, Michael, that there isn't any single reason. It, rather, there's a multitude of reasons that would be um, in play here. One would be that God wants to create a world of free creatures who can become responsible moral agents uh, and mature uh, persons. And that will require a world that operates according to certain natural laws mm -hmm. where the fire that warms you can also burn you, the water that sustains you can drown you. Uh, and it would require the ability of these creatures to do morally evil acts. And so. The, creating that sort of an arena, I think, is going to allow the possibility of natural suffering and moral evil to occur. But that God permits these with the overall goal in mind of bringing people freely into a knowledge of himself and to eternal salvation. And the goal of human life is not happiness in this life. We are not God's pets. His goal is not to create a nice terrarium here for his human pets. Rather, it is to bring persons into communion with himself forever, freely. And in order to do that, it's not at all implausible that a world suffused with natural and moral evil would be um, the correlative of that. Okay. When we come back, uh, we'll hear the first seven, eight minutes of, uh, of the other side. I promise you. Don't go away. We know where you are. Welcome back, Michael Corrin. Show uh, does God exist? One of those questions we sometimes come to every now and again, uh, even on television. Does God exist? Probably not. Why? How? Well, um, in my experience, I've never heard or seen of a single argument that would demonstrate necessarily that God exists. Right? Um, I think there's a lot of speculation about. Um, sort of supernatural causes to the universe, that type of thing. But I don't see any necessary belief uh, that we have to accept, in the same way that we'd accept many other logical arguments. Mm -hmm. What about what you heard for the first seven minutes there? Well, actually, uh, I think there should be a distinction between uh, one of the five arguments that you gave. Uh, one of them was the uh, personal appreciation for God. So I think the distinction that uh, Thomas Aquinas used uh, between revealed theology and natural theology is important here. That we have to understand that um, perhaps people did have uh, or do still have personal religious experiences, but um, we have to question whether or not uh, that would be under the same frame of debate uh, as talking about natural theology, which should be from first principles. Mm. That's hardly the center of Aquinas' writing, though, of course. I mean, that, that, that's marginal. He, he, he was really arguing from a very similar point of view as, as what we heard here. Mm -hmm. But putting aside any question of, of subjective feeling <clears throat> or personal experience, because by its nature, those can always be accepted or, or, or right. rejected. We heard arguments about, for example, um, the origin of the earth. 
uh, accidentality simply doesn't explain. An acceptance perhaps of an evolutionary pattern, but there had to be some sort of uh, imagination design initially. Why? You tell me. Um, well, I don't see any reason why we'd assume that there had to be a, uh, a, an intelligent force behind that. I think it's really up to Dr. Craig to explain to us why that is a necessary truth, not for me to defend why. Well, I can give him more time, but then people okay. write in and say, oh, you, you uh, gave him too much time. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll, defend, I'll uh, address what other people have often said, which is uh, that because the universe um, seems to be... Uh, set up for us to exist. Is this correct? Is this about what you think? That is fine-tuned for intelligent life. Okay, well, um, Whether again, us I or others. Well, okay. Then, whatever life would exist out of randomness, um, whatever intelligent life would exist out of randomness, um, I think that there's an important point about evolution which uh, is being made here, right, which is that of course evolved systems had to uh, come about in this system, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it. Mm -hmm. Also that there's a pretty strong intuition for us to believe that uh, we have a central role in the universe, right. Um, I think it was Wittgenstein was very key on this point where uh, he was once asked um, he was once said, uh, once told by someone, how ridiculous was it when people thought that uh, the sun revolved around the earth? And he asked, well, how would it look if the earth revolved around the sun? That is how it looks, right? So I think the same question uh, is very pertinent here. How would it look if it were random, right? It seems to me that it would look very much like the Earth we inhabit and the universe w that we see today. Mm. Interesting you quote uh, Wittgenstein, actually. I would have thought he, he'd probably have a little bit more sympathy with the side than yours. With oh, well, he was definitely a Catholic. And, uh, and well, he was Jewish, days. actually, but he moved was through born to, to Catholicism. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm trying to give you as much opportunity as possible. I'm not okay. hearing, right, I heard a concrete argument here, and I'm, I'm, I want to give you the opportunity to, to respond in some form. Um, let me be more broad in the question. Uh, okay. Give me a, the brief thesis as to why we should not believe in God. Um, well, why we shouldn't believe in God really depends on what you mean by belief. Whether or not we should accept the arguments really has to do with whether they correspond with the facts. Well, there can the be universe. no absolute certainty that there isn't or there is. I mean, obviously, um, you're an intelligent man. You would mm. never say atheist. I mean, atheism is, is rationally impossible. You can mm. have strongly doubt. You can strongly yeah. believe. If there was absolute proof, then God wouldn't be loving. He wouldn't give us freedom. There has to be that mm. room and not to believe. You have to want to find him. Right. But so, wh why, why, speaking to viewers out there, hundreds of thousands mm. of people watching, why would you say to them, God, God is irrelevant, don't bother. Well, I would say that it's more important actually for them to examine the, the reasons why they would believe in God, right? I actually think that that's really the first step, is to appreciate the role of skepticism and the role of taking arguments seriously and investigating them to the best of their abilities. Mm -hmm. I think that would likely lead to atheism. I don't think that it's necessary for, pe for people to have arguments for being atheists, rather that they should come to the conclusion that makes the most sense to them. Why? Because, well, otherwise then you're deluding yourself. If you're not actually thinking about what you believe, and mm -hmm. I don't think any Christian would uh, agree that you should believe it or that you should mm. believe in something simply because it was told to you. You yeah. should investigate it. I just think that that would lead to well, something because, to be uh, um, We seem to be going around in circles here. But the reason we're having the debate, uh, the debate is does God exist? Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously it's a self-evident truth that I believe in debate on these issues. Right. I want you to tell people why they shouldn't believe, if you want to use the semantics, uh, why, they, why they, they shouldn't imagine there's a God. Why, show me how there's no God. Sh give me proof that God doesn't exist. Well, we can't prove a negative. I think that's why we're going around in circ circles. Like, I can't prove the non-existence of Give anything. me an argument. An argument, uh, I think actually it was one that um, wasn't fully addressed by uh, Dr. Craig. Yeah. The, uh, the argument, I think, is, uh, is the argument from evil, right? Um, I have tended away from it in the past, but I do think it attacks something that's very central to the Christian doctrine, which mm -hmm. is the, uh, the actual nature of God, right? Whether or not they can be actually 
all good, all knowing, and all powerful at the same time. Now, this argument has changed a lot from its original conception about like 1600 years ago, right? And we have to be careful of what, how we take that argument to be. But what we do see, I think, is that it is incompatible to believe that there is genuine evil in the world, that we can, uh, that we can believe in a being that is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good. Now, what theists tend to do is to attack this idea of evil and say that it's, well, not really evil, right? Um, and that it's actually just in light of some greater good. Now, I think that that's actually a very problematic position to take because what you're doing, actually, is you're not giving an objective morality, right? What you're doing, um, actually, is to be basically an apologist for whatever God happens to do, mm. right? Yeah, I have to say, I, the only people I have heard who say there, there is genuine evil are, as you say, theists, because, for example, there's no evil in the animal kingdom. Um, right. People kill for food. There's mm. some mild torture, a cat with a mouse, but overwhelmingly mm. there's no ethnic cleansing or genocide. It's simply need. Right. But there is evil within humanity, and the theists would say, we have souls, but there is a spiritual war going on. Mm -hmm. It's been actually atheists who've said to me, there's no, there are bad people, there's, there's no supernatural evil. Well, it depends on what you mean by a supernatural evil. Certainly not, like, I wouldn't hold the position that there's some evil force in the world yeah. or there's such a thing as the devil or, like, that to me I think is ludicrous. Yeah. But the, I think there are genuine arguments for why things are ethically bad. And if that's what you mean by evil, if that's what you take to mean yeah. by evil, then there are certainly reasons why we'd have an objectively unethical behavior. Right. Right? But not with animals, only with people. Um, well, it depends on the level of cognition that we're attributing to animals, right? Whether or not they can be moral agents, uh, as well as moral objects. Does an animal ever, ever kill merely for the sport of it? Um, we see in chimpanzees, actually, that there is this sort of behavior. What do they go for? What part of the anatomy do they attack first? Um, actually, from my knowledge, it was the testicles. Yes, they do, because they're trying to stop uh, their opponents from breeding. Uh, it, it's meant to be a selfish act. It's not meant to be evil. It's not meant to be Satan. It's meant to be, I must stop you winning in the end. However, plenty of time to go uh, in, in the debate. Back in a few moments on... Uh, monkey testes? <laughs> See you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Debate, home where we're back, uh, does not exist as the issue. In the commercial break, we were discussing baboons ripping off. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, back to you, sir. Um, th this notion of evil, because it, having done talk radio for many years, it's the standard reset position, why does God allow? Now, it seems to me that uh, if you believe life ends when you're 80, 90 years old or whatever, it's a real issue. There's evil in the world. If you believe it goes on and God doesn't guarantee a good life, he guarantees a perfect eternity and, and that we have to have the, the freedom to go wrong and that God is most unhappy when we go wrong, but it has to be allowed. W would they be the arguments or are they just comforting, comfortable positions to explain why there's so many bad things in the world? Oh, I think it's very important to understand here, Michael. It's the atheist who has the burden of proof with respect to this argument. As you quite rightly, I think, pressed Michael to give us an argument that God does not exist. So if Michael wants to say that God and evil in the world are logically incompatible with each other, he needs to give us an argument to show that that's the case. And so if you can offer these well, uh, possibilities... If, such if I may, yes, um, then mm -hmm. what is actually being attacked is the conception of God, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to have some sort of clear definition of what God is before we can actually talk about anything. Right. Okay. So um, if I'm wrong in the assumption that the Christian idea of God, which I assumed you would be defending, yes. is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good, yes. then why do we see evil in the world, or why do we see uh, the necessity for evil? Now, asking why? a question, okay. though, Michael, isn't an argument. If, if you're going to claim that an all-good, all-knowing, all-powerful God is incompatible with evil, okay. Those aren't explicitly c contradictory. So if you're going to maintain okay. they're implicitly contradictory, there are some hidden premises here that you're assuming that, well, that we need to isn't there a contradiction then in the isn't there a contradiction in that uh, an all powerful being who would want only the best for the world would allow bad things to happen? 
right? And you don't see any contradiction. Well, there. let me ask you that. The, the God that uh, you speak of, mm -hmm. uh, does he uh, want um, all good for the world? I would say that God certainly wants the best for us, but remember what I said in the earlier segment. That doesn't mean happiness in this life. On the Christian view, the good for man is to be found in relation to God. And so God's overall plan for humanity is to bring people freely into a loving relationship with himself now and forever. And it is not at all implausible that only in a world involving enormous amounts of suffering and moral evil that that would be accomplished. Mm -hmm. So we've got to get away from the idea that we are God's pets and his goal is to create a nice little environment for his human pets, at least on Christianity, well, well, I, I that's that, false. I think there's something important, though, that you're missing, and that is that there seems to be a displacement of suffering in the world that uh, I think a lot of people who live in Africa who are starving right now as we speak uh, don't have the luxury of sitting in nice leather chairs and mm -hmm. talking about these like philosophical issues. Why, why are so many of them Christian? Sorry? Exactly. Why, why are so many of them Christian? Exactly. Oh, there's, uh, actually, there are great reasons for people who are, are destitute to believe in God, yeah. right? That I think it gives a lot of comfort to people in, in that type of area. Especially also, like we have to, I think, also acknowledge there is an economic force. That there is uh, a great um, need or desire from uh, pe religious people in our societies to convert those people. So, of course, it's going to work on some of them, especially when you're dealing with people who are destitute that don't have very many reasons to object to some are we offering in, Are we food. in the, um, the dangerous area here of, of, of touching on the racist? I mean, could it be that people who are, who are not um, splashing around in materialism and decadence maybe have a, a purer, more pristine vision of what really matters in the world? I, I'm sorry, I'm not really following why that, uh, what yeah. the racist comment meant. Um, <clears throat> because you're black doesn't mean you're stupid for me to be crass about it. And you say, oh, no, you say, you say destitute. Throughout yeah. Africa and Asia, there are people who, yeah. I mean, they're not all destitute, far from it. They would argue, and I've heard some of those brilliant people mm. in the world who are African bishops, for example, mm. they would argue this isn't true at all. But we, we can actually see clearly through the window, you're too busy cleaning away how much money, how many cars, how many homes. What you've said, what you've seemed to have implied at the very least is, mm. well, if you're really poor and really needy, then you'll believe. In other words, well, it may be the materialism, consumerism, and wealth of the West that is actually the spiritual impediment to knowing God and his uh, well, life. Last uh, minute, uh, last minute to you. Go ahead. Well, um, let me address that, because I certainly didn't mean it to come off as racist. It's not because they're black, right? It's because they're desperate. Right. So if someone has no ability, no education to, uh, to properly think out these problems, then I think it's unlikely that they'll be able to uh, withstand constantly being told something. Yeah. Right. I think that's true of anyone, even, t even in our society. So I certainly don't think it's racist. No, no, I'm sure you're not. But again, um, there's an assumption here that people who may not have very much money are not educated. Uh, in fact, often you have a higher literacy rate in, in, in countries that face relative poverty than here. And what is, uh, what is a challenge? We have in the West people, so many people, very sadly, sometimes necessary, on antidepressants. Uh, we have suicide attempts. Look at the suicide rates in a country like Scandinavia, for example, in that region there. So wealthy, so, suicide rates so high compared to um, parts of southern Africa. Are we not confusing things here? Are we, are we not in a rather, uh, forgive me, smug way saying they believe because? Well, um, forgive me if it sounds smug, but I do think that there is some truth and validity to the fact that there are economic impulses uh, which are used in missionary work, and that's really all I was saying. Okay. As for the uh, as for the issue of like depression, especially in our culture, I think that there's a lot to be said about that. But I wouldn't assume by any means that just because we're uh, we're in relative wealth that we have happy lives. Mm -hmm. Like that doesn't follow at all. I think we're in extraordinary extreme wealth, actually. Mm -hmm. Oh well, certainly I'd agree with that. Uh, Commercials, nice segue, wealth commercials, buy things, spend your money, then come straight back to us. We'll see you very soon.
Welcome back. Michael Gorin, show Halftime. And at Halftime, we reintroduce the panel. They're still here. Dr. William Lane Craig, he's a professor of philosophy, Talbot School of Theology, La Mirada, California. I don't even know where that is, actually. Where, where, Los where? Angeles suburbs. Oh, is it? Mm. Oh, I didn't know. Michael Payton, uh, cognitive scientist, York University, a Toronto suburb, I suppose. <laughs> I think that's about right. Yeah, we do what we can here. Uh, <laughs> you have these debates frequently. You're an apologist. doesn't mean that you say sorry, you justify, you explain uh, the, the Christian faith in this case. I mentioned at the top of the show almost 4,000 people a debate I, I moderated. Mm. Um, most of them students, and I would say two-thirds if not more seem to support the, the Christian speaker. But there is a popular assumption somehow that uh, the clever people are the atheists. Dawkins, Hitchens, Harris, the clever people, they, they, they call Christians, was it the dumbs? Uh, well, they refer to themselves as, as the brights. Do they? So I suppose that suggests the others are dim bulbs. Yeah. Well, that's kind of ridiculous, though, because just because we call um, homosexuals gays doesn't mean everyone else are, is glums, right? I think that there's a reason why we call ourselves brights, or some people call themselves brights. But there are differences in what we call ourselves. But it, how, how do you react to that? Uh, I'm Christian. Mm -hmm. I'm not brilliant, but I'm not a fool. He seems pretty clever. Yeah. Um, some of the most brilliant people I, I've met have been uh, devout Christian believers. I've met some very clever people who aren't. But can't right. we just uh, disagree rather than label one group bright? That, that seems a, a rather well, grand self-description. It's, it's not them being labeled, it's them la they labeling themselves, themselves yeah. that way. So I, I don't really appreciate the name bright. I think there, yeah. is a, there is a point to that being a bit snarky in a way. Yeah. Um, but as for like the intellectualism that happens to be around atheism, I think that comes about because there are fundamental who are very intellectual, right? You two don't happen to be those people, but there is that element, and that's a genuine concern of a lot of people. Well, th there are. I mean, without any doubt, uh, within all religions, there are fundamentalists, and fundamentalism by its nature can be rather close to the outside world and thus outside ideas. Um, but as someone I mentioned talk radio earlier, who for years has hosted a talk radio show, I meet uh, so-called atheists every day who can barely tie their shoes. Well, I think that's true. It, that's why I said at the beginning that it's important to understand why you are an atheist, not yeah. that you are an atheist, right? Having those good reasons to, and that's explicitly why I put that in the beginning. Right. There are people who are atheists, right? And atheism only really describes uh, just lack of theism. So that would accurately describe like Joseph Stalin as well as Bertrand Russell, even though they disagree on basically yeah, everything. Yeah, about that, because Bertrand Russell, of course, uh, who is well known for being a, a non-believer later in his life, said, I can no longer use the, the word atheist because I realize that intellectually it, it's not uh, sustainable. He said, I don't believe there's a God, but uh, as a materialist, unless, and by the way, materialism doesn't, of course, mean just wanting things. Right. As a materialist, unless I can see everything, I can never say there is no God. I can believe that I, that there's no God. I doubt there's a God, but I can never say there is no God. I will no longer use the word atheist. Right, and I think in that passage, and Dawkins takes this up as well, yeah. he says that, um, well, we can't really be sure, but that's where his teapot argument comes in, or the likeness to like the flying spaghetti monster and mm. fairies. And actually, the fairies one, I think, is not as silly as it sounds, right? Because there were periods of time Tell and... Us about that. Okay. There were periods of time and places where people genuinely believed in fairies. Like, in my own family, actually, my great-grandfather, genuinely in England, believed <laughs> that there were little people that... The bottom them. of the garden. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they were responsible. They were actually very active in their own lives. Like, if you lost something in your house, then it was believed that the little people had taken it, and there were just these little nymphs running around. Uh, running he didn't around become prime minister, did he? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that would be horrifying. Um, the, but I think that's... So I don't think that's as offensive as it sounds. That, like, if we believe that there's no reasons any more for believing in fairies. I, I think likely w we won't find very many good reasons for believing well, in God in the uh, future. I haven't met many people, I have to admit, who believe in fairies and... Uh, oh, not now, but yeah. that's largely my point, is yeah. that, beca that we've gotten to the stage where we've realized more about, uh, especially about how the memory system works, yeah. right? So it's likely that you simply forgot that you yeah. put the, the spoon in the yeah, dish, yeah. right? And 
I think, like, and likely I think in the future that there'll, there'll be a time when right. uh, a lot of these arguments are actually quite old for theism. Doesn't seem to... Um, Arthur Conan, I read a biography of Arthur Conan Doyle, okay. not a very good biography, but uh, a biography of Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes' creator. And of course, he, he did believe in, in fairies, and he had right. photographs of, from a couple of mm -hmm. Yorkshire schoolgirls, he was convi convinced were genuine. Um, but he, he abandoned Catholicism, he was raised a Catholic to become a, a, a spiritualist. Mm -hmm. I hear atheists talk about fair, oh, Santa Claus is a standard one. Mm. Um, there'll be emails tonight from really clever people saying, yo, your friend Santa. People who believe in Santa Claus, um, I believed in Santa Claus when I was five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. Probably not true. Um, as I grew older, reached the age of maturity, thought, read, understood, I abandoned the idea. As I got, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. As I got older, uh, mm. read, matured, understood, mm. I developed a belief in God. Uh, there's overwhelming evidence to show that as people grow, often they increase their belief in God. There's, over well, actually, hold on, hold on, hold on. there's overwhelming evidence to show that as people grow older, unless they have some sort of mental instability, um, mm -hmm. they refuse to believe in Santa anymore. They're totally contradictory. Well, actually, I'd say that I think you're drawing a parallel that doesn't really exist, yeah. right? Yeah, because sure I does. think. Well, um, no, I'd say that belief in God, especially when you cite statistics that say that people become more religious when they get older, I think that that's largely because they, there's the tendency not to become religious, but because of the nature of the demographics and how, uh, how poor the research has been in the last hundred years, yeah. that older people tend to be religious simply because... I, don't mean, older, I, mean, I mean over 14 or 15. Well, okay, okay let's, let's make it simpler then. Um, how many people over the age of 21 are convinced there's a Santa Claus? How many people over the age of 21 are convinced there's a God? And the people over 21 didn't believe in God in an earlier age, but did believe in Santa. I mean, quite clearly, people abandon a sense in some mm -hmm. things as they become mature, and they embrace a belief often when they become mature. So to, to, to compare the belief in God with the belief in Santa or fairies, it, it's, it's one of those digressionary arguments that are put forward. It doesn't really address the real issue. Oh, no, well... It I was actually giving that in response to something earlier that you had right. said. So what my point was bringing up fairies is that we have no evidence for fairies, right? right? And similarly, there's no evidence or necessary evidence for God. Good point. Right? To go to break, and we'll, we'll ask you that uh, when we come back. And the fairy community, I mean, I meant no harm or anyway. Back in a few moments on, uh, on the Mighty Car. Interesting point being made here. Um, fairies, there's no evidence that they exist, but equally, where's the evidence uh, that God does exist? I think the disanalogy is the following. We have good evidence that fairies do not exist. The reason people don't believe in Santa Claus is not simply there's a lack of evidence for him. There's good evidence that there is no such person. Uh, by contrast, with respect to God, I think we have both good evidence for the existence of God that I enumerated earlier, but I don't think Michael can present any good argument that there is no God. The atheist here has a burden of proof to sustain his claim that there is no such being as God. And I don't think this is a burden that the atheist can carry. I would like to come back to an earlier point, if Please. I may, too, and that is the notion that atheists are somehow the intelligentsia among us and so forth. I think this is just completely false. The spate of new books published by the new atheists like Harris and Hitchens and Dawkins and so forth are not sophisticated books intellectually. These are for the most part angry, uh, bitter diatribes against religion. And while someone like Dawkins may be a good scientist in his field, when he begins to talk about philosophy and theology, he is merely a layman. And The God Delusion is a very unsophisticated book intellectually as a Philosopher, I, I was just appalled at the arguments he gives in that book. Uh, it is an embarrassment, really, I think. Well, I, I can agree, and I, I, I suspect uh, Michael may, may as well. I think he would, too. If, if, the, if you look at the reviews, uh, this man is, is respected in his field. Yes. But this book, if you look at the reviews, they're, they're quite damning. I used to work with Chris Hitchens. He's a bright guy. He's a fun guy. This is not a, a profound book. It, it's a fun book in many ways. So mm -hmm. I think most people would agree that the three you mentioned in particular, Dawkins, Harris, and Hitchens, what they've written is not first-class scholarship. However, there are first-class scholars and genuine intellectuals who do certainly. not believe at, at all in Certainly, God. Certainly there are, Michael. But 
there has also been, especially over the last 50 years, since the late 1960s, a, a literal revolution in my discipline, philosophy, uh, in the Anglo-American world, which has brought about a renaissance of Christian philosophy, such that some of our finest philosophers at our most prestigious universities are now outspoken Bible-believing okay. Christians. Sir? Where is this uh, philosophical revolution taking place? I In the Anglo-American realm. Um, the ones dominated by uh, assume, assumed atheists like people like Iyer, um, people like Bertrand Russell, uh, who really dominated. Like, well, the, I'm sorry, I just never have what heard was the first this. Thing you said? I think you meant Ayer. Oh, from Ayer. 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 AJ but but that's, yeah. the, that's a bygone generation, Michael. I'm talking about or today. About, okay, let's talk about people from today, like Quine. Right? He's Who's, dead, too. Well, he died only a couple of years. Like, so did Freddie Ebb, but I mean... But, I mean well, let, no, let's well, talk AJ, about, let's AJ. name names, people like Richard Swinburne uh, at Oxford University, uh, Robert and Marilyn Adams at Oxford, Brian Leftow at Oxford, mm -hmm. uh, people like Alvin Planning at University of Notre Dame, Peter Van Inwagen, uh, Dallas Willard, Eleanor Stump. I mean, I could go on and on naming names at top universities in America and England who are outspoken Christians, such that the face of my discipline compared to the 1930s and 40s, when Russell and Ayer were dominant, has been utterly transformed. Well, I, I'd have to disagree. I do know something about the philosophical tradition and what's going on in it now. I think that, um, I think you're frankly just choosing people that are theists, right? And even if there were theists who are also philosophers, it doesn't follow at all that ju that the position is philosophically justified just because of philosophers. No, but it does follow that, they, that it is not true that the brightest brights are all these atheists. Uh, that's, that's just not the case. Well, I, I think that that's probably established. I mean, there are, I certainly, at Oxford, without doubt, that there is a whole new wave of, of Christian believers. Mm -hmm. uh, equally, there are some extremely uh, vocal anti-Christian believers. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't alter the argument. We can agree, perhaps, uh, I hope this is a fairly sophisticated setting, that there are bright people on both sides. There are intelligent, informed, decent people on, oh, yes, on, on both sides. It doesn't alter or affect the argument in any way. And on, on a purely practical level, um, before we close this segment, uh, in the UK, buses with, on the side, God probably doesn't exist, so just sit back and relax. I, I rather applaud that. I think, I think it's wonderful, as long as the other side is allowed to say God probably does exist, stop being neurotic and or whatever. Uh, but freedom of expression surely is a fundamental of any open civilized debate. Absolutely. I think we can all agree on that. What I, I so. would disagree with is the implication of the slogan that the existence of God is a trivial question that needn't bother you. Uh, forget about it. Go ahead and enjoy your life. I think that's extremely naive. When you read the writings of atheists themselves, Friedrich Nietzsche, Bertrand Russell, Jean-Paul Sartre, they recognized that the conclusion of atheism was an agonizing conclusion that uh, meant that ultimately life uh, was without meaning, uh, value, okay. purpose. Sure. I, I, I really would, uh, I, I don't think I could disagree with you more. I think you've got it basically exactly wrong. Um, especially out of someone like Jean-Paul Sartre, right? And um, I'd like to just ask you exactly where you think this uh, despair out of Sartre's work is coming from. Okay. Like, could you quote a piece of, of literature? Right. Let's break, then come back and straight to that and, and give you some more time as well. In a few moments on the Michael Carr show. Okay. If you would like to contact The Michael Corrin Show, please write to The Michael Corrin Show at 1295 North Service Road, Burlington, Ontario, L7R4X5, or send an email to info at michaelcorrin.com. If you would like to know more about CTS-TV, we invite you to visit our website at ctstv.com. Straight to it. Uh, you asked, you wanted to know where is despair evident in Sartre's writing? Was it? Yes, and, and in particular, like if you could point us to a piece of writing where you think that that's well, important. the whole uh, basis of his existential philosophy that comes out in books like Being and Nothingness is that we do not find ourselves with a God-given, pre-established set of values because he's an atheist, 
and that therefore each individual must create his own values for himself, create his own meaning in life, which leads instantly to relativism, subjectivism, and individualism. Well, it, I, I don't think that's true. I don't think that follows at all. I think that um, it's committing the uh, fa fallacy of Dostoevsky to believe that just because God doesn't exist that everything is permitted and that simply doesn't follow at all. There are obviously good reasons to be an ethical person and to have reasons for your life. What would it's they just be? A, well, for instance, I think that um, there are reasons to be good simply by the fact that we feel a necessity to do so, right? I think that in, innately, and I do study uh, moral cognition, moral psychology, mm -hmm. that's actually where my work is, right. is being focused, that there are basis of feeling empathy towards other beings, right? And I think even if we had, um, like I'd emphasize also that um, this empathy has to be established even in a Christian tradition. Like, if you go from the Bible, you're not going to get objective morality. It's actually impossible to. It doesn't follow from... Because ultimately what you'll be doing is either you'll be saying there is an objective morality that God happens to uh, be following, or you'd be saying that... You can't happen to follow it if it's objective. Sorry? You can't happen to follow if it's objective. It's either objective or you happen to follow it. Oh, okay. Well, There's sorry. Wrong, I misspoke. Me. I'm sorry. Misspoke. Um, or you're given the position that uh, morality is whatever God says it is. Right. In which case, that's not objective. That's simply a uh, an ad hoc reasoning about morality. Mm. I, I, right? think it, I think that's actually it, it may be arbitrary, but it can also be objective. W why then? If I could get away with it, why could I not uh, steal your wallet? Well, I think that there are good reasons why you wouldn't want to steal my wallet. First of all, because I'd probably punch you in the face. Well, if I can get away with it, I'm, 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 I'm much bigger than you. No, no, but I'm if I can get away with it, if I can steal your wallet, you don't know, I will never be caught. Why shouldn't I do it? Well, I think because we have, uh, it really comes down to an important question that, uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have time to get yeah, into. A couple of minutes. Okay, well, it's an important question of what is the nature of morality in, in the beginning. And yeah. I think it's a set of uh, theoretical um, uh, imperatives, right? right? That we have to think out uh, the, and rationally think out the consequences of our actions, right? Michael, so who, I think who issues these imperatives? Well, actually, I think the imperatives come from a, a system of discussing them and being rational about them. I certainly don't think that these imperatives can or do come from a god, um, especially because we do see, and you'll have to admit this, that even religious people have great differences in what they believe to be ethical behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I... I but they believe in ethical behavior. They differ in what they believe to be ethical behavior. Yeah, exactly. But you're, you're saying there is no such thing as ethical behavior, or there is, oh, and, no, you, I, I and never you can said make it up as you go along. You said answer the question, like though. Why, if I can get away with it, you won't be able to hit me, the law won't get me, why, why shouldn't I? Well, what I started out with was saying that there, we need some nature of what moral statements are, yeah. right? So from that basis, I would say that the reasoning why you wouldn't do it is because you'd have some minimal... Uh, obligation to other people, right? Why? And well, um, I think at some point, actually, moral arguments do have to drop off, right? Mm. And I think this is also true of the theist position, right? Mm. It's actually a logical fallacy to think that um, something is wrong just because I'll get beat up if I say so, uh, or if I say if I do it differently than the the bully. Well, it's says a self-preservation argument. Isn't yeah. It? Well, that's ultimately what um, what I often feel uh, theological ethics come yeah. out of is this ultimate fear okay. of hell and right. of eternity. We're out of time. By the way, I, I would recommend though you look at Sartre and du Beauvoir's uh, uh, justification of their lack of resistance to the Nazis in France. Whereas Christians who failed admit they failed, uh, du Beauvoir and Sartre oh, say, we didn't fail. Where is the logical rationale behind having to resist evil? Well, I, I uh, think... Anyway, I wish you had more okay. time. I've got a break. We'll come back with uh, emails and goodbyes and, and uh, God will tell us if we've done well or not. See you soon. <laughs>
Kelly Donovan, Ottawa, Ontario. Michael, I really don't know why you continue to insist David Menzies hold back his thoughts. <laughs> what? Especially on an issue like the use of the N-word. Why is he on the show if he can't say what he thinks? Have you seen some of the other garbage on TV these days? Yeah, of course I've seen some of the garbage. David says more than anyone else, and this is the one show he can speak his mind, but I don't think using the N-word in it, it, it fully uh, it is fun. Why, if you can... Anyway, I think you know what I mean. I think you know, know why you wrote the email. Thank you so very much. Dr. William Lane Cray, a pleasure. And uh, Michael Payton, thank you so very much indeed. I do appreciate Good that. With you. Tomorrow, uh, Friday, TW3, that was the week that was. They'll be back. Uh, until then, take care. God bless and goodbye. Michael Corrin's wardrobe supplied by Stollery's. Serving Canada's business community for over 100 years. Stollery's at Blue and Young.